Hello, everyone. Hello? Hello, hello, hello. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so before I give my intro, um, we're going to have a quick book trailer, and then I will. You can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Um, before we start the, before I do the introduction and we start the event, we're going to have a quick viewing of the trailer for this book. Hi, and welcome to Politics and Prose Bookstore. My name is Olivia Marquis, and I'm a part of the event staff here at Politics and Prose Bookstore, where we now host in-person and virtual events, along with partnered and supported events, trips, and classes. For a full list of everything confirmed, please go to our website, politics-prose.com. Before we get started today, I'd like to ask you to please silence your cell phones so as not to disrupt the event. While we've listed the mask mandate here in the store, you are encouraged to wear a mask throughout the event, and we can provide one if you didn't bring one. When we get to time, when we get to the time to opening the floor for your questions, we've placed a standing microphone right there next to that pillar um, at the end of the aisle to your right. Please line up at this mic so that everyone can hear your question as we want that question to be heard in our recording of the event. 
We are both audio and video recording and live streaming this event so that you or anyone you know can soon find it at Politics and Pro's YouTube channel or watch it live right now. After the event, please leave the chairs where they are as we have another event right after this one. So please do not fold up your chairs. Following the Q&A, we'll have a signing here up at this table. So if you have not already purchased the book, we have many copies behind our register at the front of the store. We will ask you to line up there at the pillar where the microphone is. And we will come by to ask for your name, ask your name for personalizations. So please have your books ready for us. So now, without further ado, today I'm excited to welcome Christopher Gorham, celebrating the release of The Confidant, the untold story of the woman who helped win World War II and shape modern America an engaging work about Anna Rosenberg, one of the most influential and unseen women in American history who contributed to American success throughout World War II through shaping national policies, national policies in areas long dominated by men, such as business, the military, and politics. Her impact on the nation, vital to victory and post-war prosperity, can even be felt today. This is the first book to fully recognize Anna Rosenberg's remarkable life and contributions to America's success during and after World War II. And as Brandy Schillace wrote in her Wall Street Journal review of the book, this work offers an incredible catalog into the a credible catalog of adventure of a woman who largely remained in the shadow of successes she helped achieve. From union advocacy to helping broker the New Deal and having a hand in many major policies of the 20th century. This book provides a resurrection of Rosenberg's history and life. Christopher C. Gorham is a lawyer and teacher of modern American history at Westford Academy outside Boston. He has degrees in history from Tufts University and the University of Michigan, where he studied under legendary historia, historian Sidney Fine. Gorham has a JD summa cum laude from Syracuse University College of Law, where he served on the editorial staff of the Syracuse Law Review. His writing has appeared in the Washington Post and in online journals. He and his wife Elizabeth live in Watertown and Chatham, Massachusetts. Please, joining me, please join me in welcoming to Politics and Prose, Christopher Gorham. As Olivia said, I'm a history teacher uh, outside of Boston. And five or six years ago, modern American uh, history is my topic. And five or six years ago, I saw a photograph of President Truman with a big smile on his face. Photograph, but then the captain went on to say the assistant secretary of defense. And I was very, very intrigued because you know, I've heard of Francis Perkins and we've heard of Eleanor Roosevelt and other women in, in top positions in government, but I've never heard of Anna Rosenberg. And she, you know, the number two person at the Pentagon seemed like a big deal. So I put her, I put her name, which is Anna Rosenberg. Is this on? Is this working? All right. I put her name on a list of topics for my kids to research for their big research paper in their junior year. And a couple of students chose her. They came to me a few days later and said, Mr. Gorham, there are no, can't find any books. We can't find a, not a single book on her in any of the libraries. We've checked, we've called, nothing. And a few days after that, we realized that her papers were at Harvard, uh, just a, a few miles from where my wife and I live and not far from where the kids were. So. One day, my wife and I met these students down at Harvard at the library, the Schlesinger Library, and the librarians wheeled out the carts with the crates of documents and photographs and papers, and the kids opened them up. And one of them said, Mr. Gorham, come over here and take a look. And I peeked in, and there were handwritten letters from President Truman, from Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, General Eisenhower, Senator Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson, Lady Bird Johnson, Mimi Eisenhower. It went on and on, and it was just a treasure trove of history. And I decided in that instant that I would write the book and uh, the biography of Anna Rosenberg and uh, bring her story back into the historical discussion. So as a teacher and uh, as someone who also sometimes is a student looking at slides uh, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with them. The slides, I think, help just to, to give you a sense of you know, the, the action that you might encounter in the book. I will not talk about every slide, and I, there's nothing to, you don't have to take notes, there's nothing to write down. Um, and I think what might be most interesting is if I 
uh, use some of the images just as jumping off points to maybe give a deeper uh, discussion of something that I encountered as I was doing the research or the writing. So does that sound fair to everybody? All right, so make sure the slides work here. This first picture is Anna in the center. And she was uh, from a prominent family in Budapest, Hungary. Her father provided furnishings for Emperor Franz Joseph. And they lived a nice life in Budapest until Franz Joseph broke a contract with Anna Rosenberg's father. Well, Anna Letterer was her, her birth name. And uh, Anna's father was ruined financially. And he decided to leave. He was ruined. He left Budapest and came to New York and started to rebuild his life. Two years later, he was successful enough to call for his family. So Anna, her sister, and her mother took that classic American immigrant story, you know, sailing under the Statue of Liberty, being processed at Ellis Island, and she uh, lived in the Bronx when they first uh, moved to New York. Um, but their circumstances were very, very different. Anna's father, in his two years of living in the United States, just became fiercely patriotic. He loved the idea of jury duty. He loved the idea of voting. The American flag would bring tears to his eyes. And he instilled these values in Anna right from the very beginning. For the rest of her life, she did a lot of traveling, both for the government um, and in her career. And whenever she left the United States, she always would come back and say, you know, when I've when I return to New York, when I return to the US, I have this renewed sense of love. You know, when you see that Statue of Liberty again, when you see the Capitol building again, she had this sort of renewed sense. And she'd seen a lot of the world. So she became very, very patriotic, very young. And here we have sort of these twin issues that were happening at the time. One was women's suffrage, and the other was America's entry into World War I. And of course, Anna was involved in both. She marched in suffrage marches in New York City. She was involved in the, the campaign to get women the right to vote. And when the United States entered the war in 1917, she sold liberty bonds on the street corners of New York City. And then she and her sister volunteered as uh, Red Cross nurses. So the patriotism I found in my research, I kept waiting for some document or something that was a chink in the armor. It never happened. She was consistent from you know, 1917 till she died in 1983. She loved the United States. She was a staunch defender of the ideals that we all cherish. And that was just a consistent feature of who she was. She attended public school in New York. And for reasons uh, that you can read about in the book, she was asked to leave early before she got her diploma. So there's that. That's one thing we know about her. She did not. Uh, she went to high school. She did not leave with the diploma. She was obviously very, very bright. Everybody knew that. Very, very talented person. At the same time, she's 17, 18, 19 years old. She's appearing in the New York Times for the first time, the first of many dozens of times, as a, as a student leader and as a, a, a young woman who's into the suffrage movement. So she's, she's uh, intelligent. She's fiery. She's a leader. She's patriotic, all of those things from the very, very beginning. To make a living, she got married. She got married quite young uh, to a, a veteran of World War I. And then she came under the mentorship of a woman named Bell Moskowitz. Bell Moskowitz was sort of the de facto chief of staff of governor of New York, Al Smith. And Bell Moskowitz took Anna under her wing and taught her how to exercise power from behind the scenes, which is what Bell Moskowitz is doing for Al Smith. She was writing legislation. She was uh, doing fundraising. She was um, you know, setting up uh, meetings and, and speeches and so forth for, for the governor. So Anna learned from her the power of politics from behind the curtain. And Anna got involved not only in politics as sort of a hobby for a young wife, but she started her career in labor mediation. She was in her 20s at this time. Her interest in politics as a hobby grew until she became one of the first women in American history to actually manage political campaigns. And here you see she's managing the campaign of a, a US uh, congressman named Pizer. It was, of course, successful. And she's talking to a group of other women. 
And I like to think, you know, she's telling them, you know, make your voice heard. You can make a difference. Now that we have the right to vote, let's go out and make a difference in the country. Anna was still in her late 20s when she attended a meeting in New York uh, that was sponsored by Eleanor Roosevelt, the Democratic Caucus of Women in New York. Eleanor Roosevelt says to young Anna, um, young lady, what do you do for a living? And Anna says, I'm into, I do labor mediation and uh, labor relations. Eleanor Roosevelt says, well, my husband is running for governor and he could use someone on his team with that expertise. So Anna Rosenberg became one of the teammates of Louis Howe, of Francis Perkins, and helped uh, Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or Franklin Delano Roosevelt, win the governorship in 1928. She was increasingly closer to Franklin Roosevelt for the rest of his life. So until he died in 1945, Anna Rosenberg was uh, closer and closer and closer and closer to him. And by the time we get to World War II, she's in the innermost circle of the Roosevelt coterie. In this photo, we all know who that is right on the right. Who's that on the right? The woman on the right. Eleanor Roosevelt, of course. A and can anyone identify, does anyone know who the man is in the dark suit? No. LaGuardia. LaGuardia, yeah. That's Fiorella LaGuardia. This picture is from uh, 1942 or so. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump a little bit past the New Deal uh, because of our time limitations. So, so we'll, we'll get right here. We're in World War II. It's 1942. The Little Flower, Fiorella LaGuardia and Eleanor Roosevelt were sort of co-chairs of this, uh, this organization that was meant to um, uh, have, have a, sort of the safety function of New York City in case of wartime. And they butted heads. They created a lot of headaches for Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt knew Anna's mediation skills and said, uh, Anna, who he started calling his Mrs. Fix-It, by the way, Anna, I want you to go deal with Fiorella LaGuardia and my wife and sort it out so that they don't come bothering me with all their issues. So here you have Anna quite literally in between Fiorella LaGuardia and Eleanor Roosevelt. She was very fond of both of them, I should say. Um, Fiorella LaGuardia would drive, or his driver would, they would drive together so he would be dropped off, uh, he would drop Anna off at her office in New York City, and then he would then go down to City Hall. They drove uh, every morning to work when they were in New York together. And Anna and Eleanor Roosevelt were on a Mrs. Roosevelt, Mrs. Rosenberg basis for many years, from 1928 all the way up until the early 1940s. And then they both were outraged by the Japanese internment. And Anna wrote a letter to the White House to Eleanor, knowing that Eleanor might even show it to the, the boss, um, decrying the situation out at one of the camps in Idaho for the Japanese uh, Americans. After that letter, which Eleanor read, and it's even stamped, seen by the White House, which maybe even she put it in the, the little basket that she had for her husband to, to get his eyeballs on it. But after that letter, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt always referred to her as Dear Anna. And, and she did so until she died in 1964. So they had a very, very loving relationship. They care deeply for each other, tons of respect. The letters between those two women were some of the, the most wonderful things that I found in her papers. You know, there wasn't a birthday that Eleanor had where Anna wasn't sending her a hat or a box of chocolates or some flowers. And Eleanor, you know, lovingly would write back, thank you. And when you're next in New York, come to the townhouse and have dinner with me and so forth. So really wonderful relationship. Anna was very fond of, in fact, she was famous for these hats that she wore, these uh, very elaborate hats that she would buy from Victor Sally and other fancy hat shops in New York and Washington. And sometimes she would put little flowers in the hat that were the same as the, the state flower of certain states. So the, you know, the state flower of Michigan would be one or Ohio would be another and so forth. One senator who didn't maybe care for her so much said, Anna, I see you wearing the flowers of all these different states in your, in your hats. Why don't you wear a flower for my state? And she said, because, Senator, your state flower is the sunflower. That would be the hat itself, right? 
Anna wore many hats for Franklin Roosevelt during World War II, both on the home front and overseas. On the home front, she was instrumental in solving a problem that was really going to vex Roosevelt in 1941. In the months before Pearl Harbor, the defense industries were already cranking up. The, the war was on the horizon. Americans knew it. The president knew it. These were good paying jobs, building the ships, building the planes, and they were for whites only. Black Americans were not being hired for these jobs. They were being hired, if at all, for janitor or porter or something like that. A. Philip Randolph, the black leader of the day, planned to march on Washington for equality, to get blacks hired in the defense industries, and they also obviously wanted to serve in an integrated army. For Roosevelt, this was a great worry because he feared perhaps even a spasm of violence. You know, Washington at that time was a southern town. You know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, tens of thousands of black marchers and the police would, would butt heads and it would be a, a sign of disunity at a time when the United States had to pull together to fight fascism abroad. He didn't want the march to happen. So he said to his Mrs. Fix-It, I want you to go down to, uh, I want you to go up to New York. I want you to talk to the mayor, LaGuardia, A. Philip Randolph, let's get it sorted out. She did that. The march was still on. The black leaders were not going to just uh, take uh, the word for it that maybe he'll do something way down in the future. A meeting was called for the White House, and it was a high stakes meeting. The march was going to be on, and uh, Anna LaGuardia, Eleanor was not there. The president, um, some of the, uh, the, the, uh, some of the military leaders were in the room, and uh, of course the black leaders were there. And the meeting did not go well. Finally, at the end, everyone was in a bad mood, and uh, Roosevelt said to Anna and the black leaders, go to the cabinet room, and Anna, see if you can draft something that will uh, be mutually agreeable. And it took a couple weeks, but she did. She drafted what became Executive Order 8802, which mandated hiring of black Americans in the defense industries, and also creating a watchdog provision. Uh, one historian, I think it's David Kennedy, says this was the first really significant federal action on civil rights since Reconstruction. To get Roosevelt to sign it, she had to cajole him. He was reluctant to sign this executive order. So she went shopping for a hat in a Georgetown boutique. She had her driver take her back to the White House. She walked in without even her customary greeting and took it out of her, her purse and spread it on his desk and said, sign it, Mr. President, sign it. And he did. Among the other hats that she wore, for the United States in World War II was a helmet. Anna Rosenberg was dispatched in 1944 by President Roosevelt to be his personal emissary in the, on the, in the battle zone. Just, this is just uh, several weeks after D-Day. So in uh, the late summer, early fall of 1944, she is with George Patton's first army, uh, or, or third army rather, as they're racing across France. She's sleeping in the tents. She's eating rations off the hoods of Jeeps. Uh, these soldiers are showing her pictures from their helmet and they're sharing with her their dreams and hopes for the future. And to her surprise,
as the war was winding down in 1945, I should go back just for one second. In 1945, Anna was sent again by Roosevelt to the battle zone. In fact, the last lunch she ever had in the White House was with Anna Rosenberg one-on-one. -on -one. And he commanded her to go back to, to war-torn Europe and continue the work that she'd done in 1944. But by the time she arrived there, he had died. And the mission became one for President Truman. Almost immediately upon arrival in Europe, she found out from Eisenhower, Patton and Bradley, that they had liberated the first concentration camps, and the Russians had done so on the other side. So the mission immediately got changed. General Eisenhower wanted journalists. He cabled Washington. I want journalists. I want Congress people, uh, VIPs, anyone who can come here and bear witness to this. I want them immediately. And Anna was already there. So she immediately went to Nordhausen concentration camp and saw the profound uh, just the, the, the agony of the survivors. And it was a, uh, something that I found she only talked about once. And very profoundly did she talk about it. But it was not something that she, she said uh, very often or talked about very often. But she was one of the first allied women to enter a liberated concentration camp. When she got back to New York after the war, she spearheaded millions and millions and millions of dollars and tons of relief stuff for the displaced persons, the displaced Jews of Europe. So that was something that she, she was very proud to have done. At the end of World War II, as it was winding down, Congress and President Truman created a new medal, a new award for civilians who had helped win the war. Not military people, but civilians. It was called the Medal of Freedom. Here, Anna Rosenberg is becoming the first American man or woman to be awarded what we now call the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Here she is. This is not the photo that I referred to at the very beginning of Truman sharing a laugh with Anna, but it's a very similar photo. Elizabeth, read that for us out loud if you would. It's my wife, Elizabeth. I was very happy not only to see the Wall Street Journal review of the book, The Confidant, but to use that quote. It was really, really nice. Everything we've talked about so far from 1920s, a uh, young, young New York businesswoman coming into the orbit of the Roosevelts, uh, having executive positions in the New Deal, then uh, working with Roosevelt in Washington during World War II, both on the home front. Um, by the way, her labor plan which some magazines called the Rosenberg Plan, some called the Buffalo Plan, became the nationwide model. So to get the arsenal of democracy to fire on all cylinders, and we, we sort of, I think Americans today think they flipped a switch and then it was the arsenal of democracy. And all the tanks, you know, Chrysler and Ford, they all became tanks and planes. It wasn't that easy. Getting labor where it was needed was an enormous task. You know, there's lots of extra labor in New York. There's not enough in Portland, Oregon. And one of the people that, uh, in fact, an instrumental person that fixed that was Anna Rosenberg with her labor relations expertise and her mediation between unions and, and business. So uh, her plan for the labor allotment, the way it was allotted in World War II, became the nationwide model and helped the arsenal of democracy fire on all cylinders and helped Americans be able to win the war on all the fronts and our allies. And all of that on the home front over in Europe for two missions was the first act of Anna Rosenberg's remarkable career. In 1950, Anna had finally, not she was never going to retire. She always had you know, five things in government that she was had a hand in, and, and she had her career in, uh, in public relations that she had rebuilt, in labor relations that she had rebuilt. She was finally able to buy her apartment in New York after renting for many decades. Things were good in 1950 for Anna. She and her son were running the business. They were gaining new clients like Encyclopedia Britannica and others and Studebaker. And then she opened the letter one day. The letter was from the newly installed, also pulled out of retirement, General George C. Marshall, the architect of victory in World War II. He had been called out of retirement by President Truman 
because the war in Korea had been going disastrously. And George C. Marshall um, and Eleanor Roosevelt talked about how remarkable this is. Of all the people George C. Marshall could have asked to come to Washington to be in the Pentagon with him, all the military guys, all the businessmen, all the titans of industry, she picked, or he picked uh, a civilian woman to, to be his number two at the Pentagon and to help rebuild the size and strength of the United States Army as it you know, was occupying Germany and occupying Japan and trying to contain communism in Eastern Europe and now fighting a disastrous war in Korea. Just a remarkable thing that happened that Marshall would call upon Anna Rosenberg to come down and work with him. That's Marshall on the right. She said, when Marshall asked me to come down to Washington and serve with him, I couldn't say no. So the patriotism, again, is just consistent through her life. The Senate Armed Services Committee unanimously approved her nomination to be Assistant Secretary of Defense, and it was set for the full vote. The night that the press release came out stating that, a, right, uh, a radio host uh, from, uh, he was actually based in Washington, but a radio host named Fulton Lewis got wind of this and attacked Anna on the air. Within days, Senator Joe McCarthy's involved, and Fulton Lewis and Joe McCarthy are basically planning a smear campaign to prevent Anna from getting the votes in the Senate that she needed for full confirmation. They targeted her as a communist. And the argument was, they had a guy, they found some guy in New York that would say, that would testify that back in the 1930s, he'd been in a meeting, a communist meeting, and there was Anna Rosenberg. Now, Anna Rosenberg defended herself uh, in part by you know, holding up a, a phone book from New York City and saying there are 47 Anna Rosenbergs in New York City. I mean, it's like Joe Smith. So, and sure enough, that's, that's what happened. The Anna Rosenberg communist, they found her. She was living in California. So it wasn't this Anna. She said Anna Marie Rosenberg. I have never been known as Anna. It's always Anna Marie. The Senate approved Anna Rosenberg, and she became the Assistant Secretary of Defense for the, uh, uh, the opening uh, couple of years of the Korean War. She almost uh, more than doubled the size of the U.S. Army, and it was considered a great success, her tenure there. She made two trips to Korea. Uh, in the first winter, she told the men, if you spent one winter in Korea, you won't have to spend another. I promise you that. So that's the beginning of the, the point system. So instead of serving you know, 18 months or 24 months in the battle zone, you could accumulate enough points, and then you'd be shipped home, and a new, you know, the reserves would come in, reinforcements would come in. The men loved her for that. So they did not have to spend, except for a few technicians, none of the guys had to spend two winters in Korea. You'll also notice in this photograph, integrated troops. Of course, President Truman had integrated the armed services. Um, there was some foot dragging, but by the time of Korea, the, 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 the armed services, the army was, was, was more or less integrated. What Anna found as at the Pentagon, though, was that the schools down in the southern states were not integrated. And this was in contravention of federal law. These were federal installations taking federal money Anna took on, uh, it wasn't the, it wasn't the uh, de education department back then, it was just the you know, Office of Education, but Anna took on the head of the, uh, the Office of Education. She twisted arms, both civilian and military, and those bases, the schools on those bases were integrated by the end of 1953. So the Army had integrated schools before the nation at large, before America's public schools were integrated the following year with Brown versus Ford. When Anna first got to Korea that first winter, a journalist said, uh, how many black troops are serving in Korea? And she said, that's not the question. The question is, how many American troops are in Korea? Both after her two trips to Europe in World War II and her two trips to Korea, when she returned, with that renewed sense of love for her country, she spent two or three or even four days in her apartment in New York or at the Shoreham Hotel where she lived in Washington, and she wrote letters to the parents of the GIs that she'd met. You know, Tommy's put on a few pounds, the mustache looks good, uh, he's got a nice tan, you know, they had canned peaches and fried chicken for dinner, that kind of thing. 
And these parents, these mothers and fathers wrote back. So another wonderful box of documents was these exchanges between Anna Rosenberg and the parents and the GIs themselves. They would send her, you know, uh, they would send her Valentine's cards, you know, and one of the Valentine's cards says, you know, dear Mrs. Rosenberg, this is a little bit, you know, a little bit odd, but here you have it. You know, we, we're, you're tops. You know, they would literally say you are tops. So one of the mothers wrote her um, an offer, wanted to send her a ham. And Anna wrote back, uh, I appreciate your sentiment, dear Mrs. So-and-so, but please do not send me a ham. But they're wonderful letters to read. And you can see the, you can see the attract, or the, uh, uh, the respect and the admiration up there on the faces of that sergeant with Anna Rosenberg. Some of the reviews have pointed out, and obviously some readers have pointed out, Anna was not just the confidant of one president, she was close to Truman, able to speak truly and freely with President Truman. She was part of the machinery that led Dwight Eisenhower to pivot from soldier to statesman. They shared a great admiration for each other, both in war and in peace. And of course, Senator Lyndon Johnson and then President Lyndon Johnson, Vice President Lyndon Johnson, he and Anna went all the way back to 1937. When he was on the verge of, of winning his special election for Congress in 1937, he was just this short in terms of his fundraising. And Anna Rosenberg wrote him a check for $500, which is an enormous sum in 1937. And he never forgot that. Here he is trying to give the Johnson treatment to Anna, and he's finding it doesn't, doesn't work so well. The one president for whom she was not a confidant is this one, John F. Kennedy. Kennedy knew Anna Rosenberg. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, in fact, had said to John F. Kennedy when she was sort of vetting him, um, you need to hire her. Put her on the cabinet. It's time. You know, women had, you know, obviously Frances Perkins, then uh, Ovetta Culp Hobby. You know, it was women were poised for a cabinet position by this time, 1960-61. Um, but it didn't happen. Kennedy and his advisors were uh, his advisors were almost all men. There were virtually no women in positions of uh, important decision making in the Kennedy years, and it was a bitter disappointment for Eleanor Roosevelt for women who thought they might be, you know, sub-cabinet or cabinet, and certainly for Anna Rosenberg, who would have taken whatever, you know, cabinet position job that, that he would have offered, be it labor, transportation, or whatever, but it was not in the offing. Nevertheless, being the loyal Democrat that she was, she became a, a, a fundraiser for Kennedy when he asked her to, and in fact, in 1962, she co-hosted the birthday gala event at Madison Square Garden to celebrate the president's 45th birthday party. She, Anna, and Arthur Krim put together the list of folks who would be entertaining, from Ella Fitzgerald and Danny Kaye to a dance troupe to Marilyn Monroe, who would appear at the very end of the program. And you can see in that photo, that's John F. Kennedy next to Anna Rosenberg. That's where she sat the entire evening. After the event, they all went back to the Krim's apartment and this is where the only photograph of Robert Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, and Marilyn Monroe was taken. When Anna had been in Korea with the troops, she always joked. The troops asked me, you know, what do you, what do you guys need? What do you guys want? And they always said, send us Marilyn Monroe to entertain, right, to sing and so forth. And Marilyn Monroe read this in a newspaper out in L.A. Mrs. Rosenberg said, you know, the GIs want me to go to Korea. And she said, well, I you know, think the world of those guys too, and I'm gonna do that. So in 1954, uh, Marilyn Monroe did go to Korea and entertain the troops. This picture from 1962, however, is more of a sad one. She would only live about 70 more days. In 1959, Edward R. Murrow, the great journalist, had Anna Rosenberg on his TV show, and he heard her exploits, and he said, in fact, I'm gonna let Elizabeth read this for us again. Anna said, Ed, that's a book that will never be written. She went on to say, though, that she would let the writing be done by writers, and uh, she didn't consider herself one of those. Now, that leads to a question. Why don't we have a book? Uh, maybe we'll leave that for audience question, though. Uh, so let's see if I have one last slide here, and we'll get to your questions. 
Anna and her first husband had one son. First husband married 37 years. They separated, and Anna married a second, second time to the to Paul Hoffman, who was the first administrator of the Marshall Plan, and they had a nice 10 years together before he died. Their one son, Thomas, had uh, a son also named Thomas, and that's little Thomas right there in 1960. Thomas was at the launch event up in, uh, at, in Cambridge, Massachusetts a couple of weeks ago for the book. I interviewed him for the book, but because of COVID, I hadn't met him. So he and his wife were there, um, you know, overcome with emotion, uh, but able to share these wonderful stories. He, it was a really wonderful night to have him there. And uh, one of the stories was he, when he was teenage and, and 18 and 19 and 20, he and his father would play bridge with Anna and her sister. And the bridge game would be, you know, would going on, going on, everything's good, everything's even, even keel. Then the two sisters would start to speak in Hungarian. And then the bridge game would go south for the two men, and they wind up losing. So he loved that story. I think this is a good time. We're about uh, 12 minutes to the hour. It's maybe this is a good time to have some questions. Uh, what they would like is, if you have a question, I hope you do as a teacher, I invite questions, so I want many, many questions. But they do ask that you could come up to that microphone um, uh, and uh, because it's being recorded. So if you have a question, come on up. And uh, I, know there's, I know there's questions out there. <laughs> Thank you. They are those boxes at Harvard Schlesinger Library. A couple of the boxes are just their old photo albums. Just like you know, maybe you or I would have, you know, just like the vinyl covered with the with the sort of the plastic sleeves, and you just flip them open. And who who, who collected the, the archive? I should have mentioned her son, Thomas, oh. in 1987, four years after Anna died delivered those documents and papers and there's some microfilm and there's other newspaper clippings and photo albums to the Schlesinger Library. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. My maiden name is Rosenberg and we're from Hungary and I was all excited about maybe she's a relative. <laughs> but she was letterer then, right? She okay. was letterer. So forget that. Yes. Um, uh, why do you think there has been nothing written about her? Nothing major? She was Eleanor Roosevelt. One of those letters in the, the box was a correspondence between Eleanor mm -hmm. and Anna. One of the letters is Eleanor saying, I have a biographer that I've met, and I'm, here's his information, and I want you to talk to him. And she was always so def deferential to Eleanor but not in her response. She was very, very clear. She didn't say no way, but essentially she said not happening. This is not happening. She felt that the, after all of the New Dealers and Roosevelt people left Washington, they all wrote memoirs. There were 30 of them. I mean, <laughs> everybody had a memoir. It was the me, and, the me and FDR memoir was a feature of bookstores and you know, it was just a thing. She had no interest in that. She found it quite distasteful. And you know, she she thought I've been in the sunroom of the White House one on one. I've been dinners and lunches one on one with with Roosevelt, with with Truman. I've been told things in confidence and the confidant. You know, she she felt like she didn't want to betray the confidence that she had been trusted with. She's unusual. Very unusual. And you, yeah. see, you see, obviously, today. Yeah. The almost the exact opposite. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing is with regard to the name, you know, sharing the surname with the atomic spies or alleged atomic spies, you know, Rosenberg's, as you well know, around the country. I, I was, when I write, when I was reading about them, I, I was, I was shocked, lost jobs, lost friends, you know, people shunned them. And, you know, she didn't say ever, Anna never said she was ashamed of her name. That was not the case at all. But I think her, she already didn't want to trumpet her own accomplishments. It she was, was very humble. It was never about her. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It was always in the service of the leaders or the people or the ideals for which she fought. Yeah. But having that uh, unfortunate coincidence of names certainly didn't help. 
No. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for that really interesting talk. Um, Thank you. You provide a bunch of examples of her having um, progressive views on civil rights and racial equality. Um, I was wondering, since she lived into the 80s, um, which is well into the women's rights movement and the countercultural uh, revolution, um, I was wondering if you knew what her stance on those historical developments was. In, with regards to sort of the, the feminist of that era, one thing that Anna was clear about was, um, and, and I'm not sure this is going to maybe ideally address, address your question, but she was clear that she wanted to dress the way she wanted to dress. She wanted to dress in a, a womanly way, a feminine way, with the hats, with the, the heels, with the makeup, with the bangles that she was famous for. And when she was asked, you know, does that sap your, your power? when you wear a hat like that or when you jangle down the hall with your with your bracelets she said you know absolutely not you know this is this is who i am and this is who i'm i have to be and uh, was just not interested in changing that she was going to she did not feel that it it sapped her her power in those rooms uh, with those military leaders and those 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 mil and those uh, political leaders as for uh, 1980, the sort of the last time that she's in the paper before she dies, and it's in her, she's she's in the New York Times obituary section, was in the 1980 or 81 uh, air traffic controller strike. She had met Ronald Reagan a million years before when he was uh, a, a union leader for the Screen, Act Screen Actors Guild. So he's a left wing guy, Ronald Reagan. He meets Anna Rosenberg, who's been sent to represent the studios. And he says, you're the stalking horse of the management. And she says, can I say this? Are we all adults here? She says, we're not going to trade a lot of BS. And she didn't say BS. So look, Mr. Reagan, we're not going to trade a little, uh, any BS. We're going to get down uh, and, and solve the problem, which they ultimately did. But the air traffic controller strike, she felt, was an absolute uh, abomination. She thought it was misplayed, mishandled by, by President Reagan. And um, you know, by that time, though, she was. She was an older woman. So I think to, 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 to summarize, I think after the Johnson years, after about late 60s, she kind of was in the paper sporadically and not so engaged with these, these, uh, these flashpoints. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's a hard one. <laughs> Good question, young man. Um, thank you. You talked a lot about how Eleanor Roosevelt really tried to cultivate women in politics and leadership. And I was wondering if Anna herself tried to pave the way for women and what were some of who, who were some of the people she mentored and what did their careers look like? She did. That's a great question. Uh, Lillian Poser, if I'm getting the name right, Posner was uh, a young woman lawyer went to NYU and she was very, very close to Anna Rosenberg. And that was one woman that I know she mentored. Um, I was at a, a talk just the other day and one of the, uh, it was a Zoom, Zoom uh, presentation, but one of the attendees said, my mother also had sort of a similar story to tell. So that was another woman that, that she, she mentored. But besides the sort of the people that were close to her that she was able to mentor, she said to the black women of Buffalo. She said to the women that were doing the rivets during World War II, she said, consolidate. She said, let's make some gains together. Let's consolidate those gains. We're going to get these jobs. We're going to get this raise. We're going to get these positions uh, of decision making, and we're not going to relinquish them. Now, then we get to the 60s, though, in the Kennedy years, and I think we see that take a step back. Um, did she leave a legacy for women? Uh, you know, there's, a, there's an article from the New York Times, hers column from 1980 that says, when we were growing up, it was Eleanor Roosevelt, it was Frances Perkins, and it was Anna Rosenberg. And those are the three women that we saw in that generation as changing, moving the needle, changing the country. So she was seen as th that type of, of, of uh, inspirational uh, leader by other women. It took a while, right? We have, you know, it took for Condoleezza Rice and Madeleine Albright, and now we have many, many women governors and Congress people. But it did seem like it took an awfully long time. But maybe finally that's happened. Um, I was sitting here thinking about her character and whether she was tough or not. And um, when you mentioned her exchange with Reagan, 
spurred me to get up to ask this question. And yeah. so uh, because she went out to the battlefield with the, with the soldiers, and there's a lot of things that it's implied that she had to put up with. Oh, yeah. So I was just wondering, how was she a really tough lady? And knowing that she came, her the little brief bio on her dad, and she looks like a daddy's girl, the way she took took <laughs> off, just must have been a tough cookie to deal with. So I just wanted you know you know touch on that. She was as tough as a two dollar steak. Okay. <laughs> she, she could. The union guys. There's these great stories from when she's a young woman in the, in the when she's in her twenties and thirties. You know these union guys would use language. You know, and she heard that, and she could use it right back. You know, okay. she could say "pipe down, boys," and use a little saltier way to say that. Um, but also, she could. She did have the ability to be very uh, graceful socially, um, and that's why her emotional quotient is just off the charts. I mean, she could. She could be one person. She's always genuine. Whoever she was talking to, they were the only person in the world. So the genuineness was always there. But she had the ability to be genuine with union men, uh, tough guys, teamsters, truck drivers, but also people that, you know, owned factories and people that were senators, you know, United States senators, but very, very tough to be Jewish, to be a woman, to be, uh, to have an accent. She grew up in the Bronx. Too. She grew up in the Bronx. So you had to be a survivor. You had to be a survivor. <laughs> That's a great word for her. Yeah. Thank you for the question. It's a great question. What would you ask Anna Rosenberg one-on-one -on -one over coffee? Oh, I, you know, I might. I might ask her the question that Edward R. Murrow asked, you know, being, you know, I might frame it like I would say, Anna, you know, we're at a point in our history where we need more women in politics and your story really tell your story. You're amazing. You're inspirational. You're compelling. And, um, and I, I would have, I would have asked that of her, you know, what, a, what a career, you know, I was, as I was doing the research again, I kept waiting for, you know, she was Zelig. She was an intentional Forrest Gump. It wasn't an accident, but she was in all of these pivot points of history that allowed me to create a narrative out of her life that works. And I was surprised by that. You know, it just, it just kept happening. It's like, oh, she was in a concentration camp. Oh, she was, you know, she was the GI Bill. Oh, there's, you know, the National Institutes of Health. Go back to Anna and Mary Lasker. And it just on and on. What a career. And please put it down on paper. Um, but then I guess I wouldn't have had the ability to do that. I'll help you. No, no. It's a great question. With all the presidents that she was associated with, and, and there has been biographies always written by of presidents, so was her name mentioned in these biographies? That's a wonderful question. The biography, No Ordinary Time, or the, it's, a, it, it's, it's a sort of a narrative, No Ordinary Time by Doris Kearns Goodwin, talks more about Anna Rosenberg than any other presidential biography or, or narrative around a president. Um, and it was in connection with the Executive Order 8802. So that was part of my clues that she had a bigger role than previously thought. There are, I regret to tell you, lots of, um, in Truman by David McCullough, he interviewed her. And she's in that, that wonderful biography of Truman. But I also regret to say that in so many, she doesn't merit one single mention. You know, but, but Kearns Goodwin and David McCullough are two of, you know, two of our best, and, and she's in there. Um, and others, Joseph Lelyveld, some of you may know that name, uh, speaks. Joseph Lelyveld said she could, I quote him in the book, she could find herself one-on-one uh, -on -one with Roosevelt more than most of his cabinet members for meetings. So, uh, which, which rankled a lot of those cabinet members, but that's a great question. Yeah, I was curious, you mentioned that she was asked to uh, leave high school or something. I didn't understand what you were. I think her parents were eager. Again, they, their circumstances were a lot different when they came to New York. And I think they were trying to get uh, more education for their daughter. And I think there might've been a two year uh, fudging of the age. So I think the school found out she was 18 and uh, she was obviously super bright. The, the principal of the school adored her. Her classmates put her up as their leader when they were dealing with uh, a student strike during uh, World War I. So it wasn't anything to do with her bona fides. It was just she was 18 and that was the rules. So great questions.
Do I see? I hate to ask it because it's a minor point. I hate to end on this, but I'm wondering when her father lost the job in Budapest, um, was there any hint of uh, anti-Semitism in that move or what was the... Uh... Yeah, you know, yeah, it was, it was a feature of the feature of the times in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Right. Um, yeah, so there was, there was, a, 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 it was a, a palpable sense that that was, that was there. It was a, a latent thing in the air at that time, anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that in, is that in the book or is that, uh, described? I at think all? between the lines, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I, I, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not sure if I say it in quite that way, but, uh, I, I think it, yeah, I think it's, it's there. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. That's yes. perfect. It's a good question. Thank you. Do I see a familiar face back there? Maybe is that a new is that a, a new intern for the Department of Justice? Victoria, good to see you. One of my one of my uh, students from Westford Academy in the back now, who's uh, interning for the DOJ. Love love to hear it. Oh, look at you! <laughs> how great! How wonderful! Sarah, great to see you. Do either of you have questions, or do you ask me enough questions? <laughs> Well, I know there's another uh, presentation right behind us. Um, I'll be up here if you'd like me to, to describe something in your book or just sign my uh, name in the book, I'd be happy to do that. So thanks all for coming. It's a beautiful day.